Uh, very happy to play host to uh, the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy Symposium today, um, as the LEC often does for programs in and around the Antonin Scalia Law School. In addition to holding uh, several dozen educational programs for legal professionals ranging from judges to uh, congressional staff members, state attorney general, uh, staff attorneys, uh, and other legal professionals. Um, we uh, help out around the Antonin Scalia Law School by holding open programs like this one. Our keynote speaker today uh, will need no introduction to many of you, but uh, for the one or two people here who have not uh, uh, heard of and uh, read Philip Howard's work, let me uh, give you a brief introduction. <clears throat> Philip is a senior counsel at uh, Covington and Burling in New York City, uh, but he is best known not for his occupation, but for his vocation as a leader in the legal and regulatory reform movement. Uh, I first became aware of Philip in 1994 when uh, this came out, uh, The Death of Common Sense, in which he argued that America is drowning in law, lawsuits, and nearly endless red tape. Uh, since then, he's devoted much of his time to fostering a national dialogue about how to change our legal and regulatory systems, to work better, and to make more sense. He's written three more books, most notably in 2014, The Rule of Nobody, Saving America from Dead Laws and Broken Government, in 2002, he co-founded Common Good, a nonpartisan coalition organized to restore common sense to American public life. And more recently, in 2016, he and former New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley launched SimplifyGov.org, which is a website at that URL, simplify uh, SimplifyGov.org to help build a bipartisan consensus around specific regulatory reforms. Uh, Philip has received numerous awards and honors for his legal reform efforts, uh, and The Village Voice even called him, quote, one of New York's heroes, end quote, for his civic work. Uh, with that, I give you Philip Howard. Thanks, Greg. It's really nice to be down here. I had uh, uh, a few encounters with Justice Scalia. I used to uh, say, you know, you and I don't agree on these things. He said, oh, yes, we do. We agree on everything. You know, we'd go and completely manipulate what I'd said into his theories. Um, it was just it was incredibly charming. Um, uh, I have been at this for, for quite a long time. Every once in a while, a funder from my not-for-profit asked me what I've accomplished. And I, I tell them uh, accurately, nothing. Um, there's, this, there's this aspect of, of uh, pursuing what you believe in, notwithstanding uh, repeated failure that uh, maybe is the, we were just talking about the insane governing system. Maybe it's my own insanity that's really, really an issue here. Uh, happily, I have another life. So it's not something I'm, I'm completely invested in. Um, uh, what I'd like to do today for uh, a few hours is, um, um, is, is try out an idea uh, on you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I just agreed to write a book due in May uh, this year, uh, proposing a new governing philosophy for the, for the United States and, and critiquing the um, governing philosophies of both parties. And actually, the ideas of all reformers. My, one of my goals is to offend just about everyone. Um, uh, and the general thesis is this. I think that uh, the US may be uh, at an inflection point. It's been building up, the, the pressure has been building up for a long time, really since Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, remember, got elected in 1976 as an outsider, including on a reformed government um, agenda, a clean up Washington agenda. He didn't use the words, words drain the swamp, but close. And it's just gotten more. In 2008, Obama got elected. His, his campaign theme was change we can believe in. And when that didn't work out, eight years later, eight million Obama supporters turned around and voted for Donald Trump. 
pretty much 180 degrees the opposite person and philosophy as Obama because he had promised to drain the swamp. So, so what does that mean? How does Washington work at T plus one the day after the swamp is drained? Constitution Avenue is finally dry land. How are bureaucracies going to work better and we're going to contain health care costs and, and, and solve many of the problems of the society? Well, if you really push, uh, uh, press down into what uh, Donald Trump is saying, and not that easy to do, um, it, it, it's basically versions of deregulation. You know, they're, we're going to get rid of the executive orders of Obama. Okay, he can do that. He has the power to do that. But deregulation's been the theme of every Republican president the last 40 years. I mean, it was Reagan, had the Grace Commission, uh, George Bush talked about it, and government's only grown. Even when the Republicans control Congress and the White House, government has only grown. Well, why is that? I think one of the problems is that, uh, is that deregulation has sort of faltered at the doorstep of public demand that people actually want clean water and safe workplace. And so it's not that there are not problems with the way we regulate those things, but that amputating the limb is maybe not the right cure to what I think of as a form of mental illness, which is how we regulate these things. So, um, so it's not clear to me that uh, that deregulation is the right approach is, is going to work. So I think what, what I'm going to suggest is that we need a new way of looking at this. And instead of sort of focusing on wandering into the jungle with our pruning shears and trying to reduce regulation, which Cass Sunstein also did with Obama, is that what we need to do is look at why things are failing. And I would bet that in eight out of 10 idiotic government actions, um, if you trace back through the line, you will find places where a person wasn't able to do what they thought was sensible, an official or a citizen. And the examples of this are all over the place. So I give a few stories. A couple of years ago, tree falls in a creek uh, in Franklin Township, New Jersey, causes flooding. The mayor sends in a backhoe to pull out the tree. And the uh, village lawyer says, no, you can't do that because it's a class C1 creek, whatever that is. And you have to get official permission. It took them two weeks and about $12,000 in legal fees to get permission to pull a tree that had fallen into the creek, out of the creek. Really stupid. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, here in DC, a retired Parks Department employee was walking with his daughter uh, on the street, had a heart attack, happened to be in front of a fire station. The firemen were, were standing out front. The daughter runs over to the fireman and says, I think my father just had a heart attack. Um, please help. They're trained as first responders. Uh, they said, no, the proper procedure is to call 911. He's lying on the ground, and she's gasping for breath, please. No, no we'll, we'll, we'll call 911 for you. They called 911, ambulance got lost. By the time it got there, 15 minutes later, uh, he was dead. The, uh, I could t actually tell you dozens of stories like that, where people don't do do what's right. So let's take that up to a level of policy. I've been very involved in infrastructure red tape. We, at Common Good, we published a white paper in 2015 called um, Two Years, Not Ten Years, which we analyzed the cost of the permitting process for, for rebuilding infrastructure. And there were all these incredible stories. Uh, uh, I became friendly with the guy who was running the Port Authority of New York. So he opened the doors to me. They had this project to raise the roadway of the Bayonne Bridge um, so that the new generation of post Panamax ships could come in to, to, to Newark Harbor. And a lifetime employee, Joanne Papa Georges is her name, uh, came up with the idea, instead of spending $5 billion on a new tunnel or a new bridge, just to use the foundations of the existing bridge and the arch and just move the roadway up. In the, same, using the same 80-year-old thing, the engineers looked at it. They could do it. It would save three quarters. It would be 20 or 25 percent of the cost. It would have no environmental impact. Using the same foundations, the same arch, 
you know, modest construction stuff. The environmental assessment, that's a short for environmental review, ended up being 20,000 pages, including uh, 10,000 pages of exhibits. Uh, they, they had to do a survey of historic buildings within a, a two-mile radius of either end of the bridge, uh, even though the project was not touching any buildings, much less historic buildings. Uh, and of course, to do the survey, you have to go through its own government process. You have to have an RFP for the expert to do the survey. So it's just the process itself to hire the historical consultants to do the study that isn't needed takes six months. Uh, they had to invite Native American uh, tribes from around the country to participate in the process because there might be artifacts somewhere there, even though they weren't really changing the ground or digging anything up, and it is metropolitan New York. Uh, it's been a long time since Native Americans lived there. Um, it, it was, the process ended up taking five years because Joanne Papa George was very determined, otherwise it might have taken 10 years, um, probably uh, close to double the cost of the project. Um, oh, and then after it was all over, they were sued alleging uh, inadequate environmental review. Uh, so I won't get into all of that. But that was sort of a, a story which had um, made you realize that sort of no one was in control of this process. So we did a study saying, well, what is happening with environmental review here, other countries? So what we found was that other greener countries, Germany, for example, um, went through an environmental review process and did their approvals within a year or two on complex projects, like tunnels through the city, under the city of Leipzig, or big offshore platforms in the North Sea, things like things that, are, that would be environmentally sensitive. They did in one to two years, this a greener country than the US. Canada, similarly. In our country, uh, most big projects would take, give or take a decade, anything of any, you know, any size. So we did an analysis, well, what does that cost? Well, it turns out that a six year delay in permitting, is just assumption, but not an unfair assumption for big projects, more than doubles the cost of a project. So we're paying twice as much the effective cost, about half of its hard cost and half of its foregone opportunity cost. So we're paying effectively twice as much for the infrastructure on big projects because of delay. Um, we also found that lengthy environmental review, in most cases, is dramatically harmful to the environment because it prolongs uh, modernizing the infrastructure. So we have rickety transmission lines that waste so much electricity it's equivalent to 200 coal burning power plants. Or we, we don't, you know, we delay um, curing the bottleneck somewhere. We have, there's a project to uh, put a new tunnel under the Hudson River, a new rail tunnel, because the existing two tracks under the Hudson that we all take when we go to New York are in tunnels that are 105 years old. They were badly damaged by Hurricane Sandy. Um, they were, it was already under capacity. Getting there, you have to go over a bridge between Newark and New York called the Portal Bridge, which is made of wood and cast iron. Uh, it sometimes catches on fire. This is the bridge that the cellar goes over. It opens a couple of times a week to allow garbage barges to go by the river. Sometimes it gets stuck in the open, and they have to send people with sledgehammers to line up the rails again so that the Acela can make it into the tunnel. Again, this is crazy, right? So they were going to do an environmental review process. Oh, and every time one of the existing tunnels shuts down, which it does from time to time because it was damaged by Sandy, it causes 50,000 cars to go on the road, creating a 25-mile gridlock. Horrible for the environment. So they were going through the environmental process for this. It was going to take years. Even their streamlined version. It's like really madness. So the same people, my, my moles in the, in the government, called me up and said, can't you humiliate these people into doing something? And so, uh, so we did a separate white paper on the Gateway showing that a two-year delay in review would cost taxpayers $3.4 billion. 
And we hired a writer from The Daily Show to do a cartoon video about how idiotic this was. And then the Washington Post did a feature story on the cartoon video. And miraculously, <laughs> the process got accelerated. So now it's actually virtually about to get approved just in the timing now. Trump's threatening not to fund it, but it will get funded because 25 mile gridlock is not politically acceptable to anybody on, on, on either party. So how do you solve this, this environmental um, problem? Well, the, you don't solve it by gutting environmental laws. I don't know what Trump's going to do. He said he's been echoing our report. Hillary cited my report when she was running. It, it shouldn't be political, but it's become political. Environmental groups are now attacking me. They attacked me yesterday, um, saying there's nothing wrong with the current permitting process. I mean... I mean, literally, that's crazy. I mean, why would they even want to do, argue that? It's, it's bad for the environment. It's because they're opposing Trump. So, so we have a proposed legislation, legislative amendments, um, that's three pages long. And the amendments are, we create clear lines of authority to decide how much environmental review is needed on each project. We give the authority to the chair of CEQ, Council of Environmental Quality. So then something like the Bayonne Bridge I'd say, I'll just give me 50 pages on construction impacts. And that would not be the appeal. But I still have to comply with NEPA, but they can use their judgment about what's really important. Uh, we would give someone in the White House authority to resolve uh, disagreements among bickering agencies, which can, can delay things by years. We would preempt state and local approvals if they lasted longer than the federal approvals. And we would uh, expedite litigation and limit it to material impacts on the environment, not footfalls. You can do all those things. You can create those lines of authority in less than, less than three pages. Um, you, don't, and you don't have to touch NEPA or any of the underlying uh, laws. Now, this is a radical idea of actually letting people make decisions. And I'm, I'm sort of having an argument with somebody. I was on the Trump CEO Council somebody in the White House about this, said that we want to solve the problem once and for all, they said. They said, you know, you can't really solve, that's the problem with current law, to try to solve problems once and for all by writing everything in codes. You can't solve a problem once and for all. If Bernie Sanders gets elected president and he wants every environmental review to be 20,000 pages, that's what you'll get. And then if the voters don't like it, they can vote him out. What you can do is create a mechanism where somebody who wants to do the right thing can do the right thing. And the current law doesn't, doesn't allow that. Uh, I was, after this report came out, I was summoned to uh, meet with officials in the, in the Obama White House to talk about it. And they said they thought they had solved the problem because in uh, a transportation bill known as the FAST Act, which is really not the FAST Act, they had, uh, they had created... Um, a mechanism for resolving interagency disputes by creating a 16 agency dispute resolution council, <laughs> which, which, which brings to mind the, the, the kind of wonderful aphorism by somebody, which, uh, um, uh, which is, um, nothing is impossible until it's sent to a committee. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I asked, so I asked the, uh, um, I'm at the White House, and I'm or in the old executive office building, and I'm, uh, so there's a whole group of officials there, and, and I asked him, well, how long do you think it'll take to schedule the meeting? They said, well, we don't know. I said, well, how long, you know, so these people who get delegated by each of their 16 agencies come to me, how much authority do you think they will have to actually make a deal with the other agencies? I don't know, we haven't thought about that. Uh, I said, I think I know how much authority they're going to have, which is like none, right? They've been they've, they've given their marching orders. So I said, well, just in case they don't reach an agreement in the 16 Agency Council, who has authority to make a decision? To which the response was immediate and declarative. No one has that authority. That would be too dangerous. This is a serious problem with the structure of modern government. It's been organized to avoid people making choices because we're so scared of bad choices 
why we have all these words of, 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 of regulation. And I don't think it can be fixed until we restore the primacy of authority and accountability in our system. And the way to, and this is not going to happen by tweaking something. I mean, what I'm arguing, we'll be arguing this book, is a kind of revolution. Now, it happens to be the structure that our framers thought they were giving us, uh, a structure where people have public goals, where law sets goals and principles, and you have accountability mechanisms, you have checks and balances, all that's fine, but they all ultimately hinge on human judgment. Humans take responsibility and accountability. Manifestly, how not this, how the system of government's not organized. But there are two, not only do you need the idea that they make judgments, there are two other incredibly revolutionary changes that have to be made to uh, have a system of government, I think, that can conceivably be responsive to our society. The first is that if you're going to give people responsibility, you, they have to be accountable. The modern civil service system is not what the original service system was intended to be, it was not intended even to be tenure, and certainly not to be no accountability. It was intended to be a system of neutral hiring, where you don't get a bunch of political hacks coming in as soon as somebody's new elected and don't know what they're doing. You have a professional civil service who know what they're doing. There's continuity from, um, from administration to administration. That all makes perfect sense. But it got captured by the unions and in 1978, an executive order by JFK was a payback to the public unions that allowed them to collectively bargain, was codified by Congress in the Civil Service Reform Act 1978 so that the President of the United States has no, effectively no authority over executive branch employees. I argued in a white paper last year published in the American Interest and now the Federal Society is going to have a program on it at their annual meeting that the federal service system is clearly unconstitutional because Article II gives the president power over the executive branch and there are 50 Supreme Court cases, including the ones making exceptions, that make it absolutely clear that Congress cannot tell the president for most, except for judicial type executive uh, branches, that he can't fire somebody. They can, put, they can put all sorts of reasonable limits on neutral hiring and other things, but they can't actually effectively take away his authority. That's what they've done. And you'll never restore a system where people use their common sense unless people, when they abuse it, can lose their jobs. And by the way, that's the right dynamic for getting people to make the right decisions. The point is not to go around firing people. The point is that people know that they're going to be accountable, just like all of you know if you don't do your job, you might lose it. It's not that you're in fear of losing, you know, getting fired every day. It's just that you have to, that sense of tension is important for life. The second thing that needs to happen, which, um, which is harder, is that somehow we need to come up with a mechanism by which Congress can actually adapt laws and programs to unintended circumstances and new priorities. If you polled members of Congress today about who is responsible for the farm subsidies from the New Deal, they would say, well, it's not me. That was passed back in 36. You know, or whatever. I mean, they don't even have the idea that they're responsible. If you ask them, you said, well, you know, the special ed law is well-meaning and everything, but do you know that it now consumes over 25% of the total K-12 budget, and it's a bureaucratic nightmare? Why, who's responsible for that? They would say, you know, those people who wrote that law back in 1975. So you have this democracy run by dead people. I mean, it's, you know, who, who, it, literally they don't know that they're in charge. And they're set up so that they can't even pass a budget, we're learning, much less go and fix something. Every single federal program is broken. Every single one. Find one that's not. The question is whether it's broken 25% or 75%. And the reason they're broken is not because most of them are bad ideas. I'm kind of a bleeding heart liberal type. I think most of them are good ideas. It's just that nobody ever goes and fixes them. 
But what happens is what's happened to special ed or disabled laws or all kinds of other things is that nobody goes and adjusts them so that they work. Nobody makes practical choices. And in the case of Congress, they don't even have the idea. Instead, what do the Republicans' leader do? They propose bills to veto anything the agency does. I'm all for, by the way, them having control over agency actions and regulations of delegated lawmaking. But you would think at some point they'd get the idea that maybe they should fix the underlying statutes. I mean, it's really incredible. They're sitting there pointing fingers at agencies. The agencies are authorized by statutes. The statutes themselves are most of the time the bigger problem, and they don't even have the idea of fixing them. How do you fix that problem? I mean, it really was a problem with the framers. The framers made it difficult to pass new laws, so they didn't want to have so many laws. They didn't realize that the same process is required to get rid of old laws, except now you've got a special interest group surrounding the old law, like armies of them, sort of on the Matthew Olson point. It's exponentially harder to change a law than it is to pass it in the first place. You've got 5,000 interest groups here in Arlington, in Washington, uh, whose main job in their lives is to defend the status quo, is to defend all these laws and programs. This is a serious problem. Um, my one structural idea, not a cultural idea, it's a bigger one, is that maybe Congress could reorganize itself without a constitutional amendment to work by committees. And as long as certain indicia were met, the minority leader agrees with the amendment, for example, something like that. So there's an issue of bipartisanship with it. The protocol would be everyone agrees to vote for the change. And so you have a legislature of 20 or 30 people or 15 or 30 uh, changing whatever the law happens to be and everybody else votes for it. Because under the current constitutional system, if you don't have something like that, literally, you know, all these laws were passed 20, 30, 40, 100 years ago. And all they do is waste money. I did a list of how many obsolete programs you could change, how much you could save. I came up with almost a trillion dollars a year. A trillion dollars a year if you went through 10 areas and simply made them practical. You change the procurement guidelines. You go from a fee-for-service model on Medicare and Medicaid to an integrated care provider model, mandatory, so you don't have all that paperwork. That's, that's $100 billion right there. Um, just uh, special ed, $30 or $40 billion. You know, not getting rid of it, just making it practical. You can come up with almost a trillion dollars just by fixing programs that everybody, everybody knows are broken. So that's, that's, I think, the challenge here. I, you know, I don't think we're ever going to do the kind of regulatory reform that people want by accepting the frame of reference, this whatever the current jungle is, going in, pruning it here and there. Public pressure, you know, Washington's like the lid on a volcano. People are really, I grew up in eastern Kentucky. People in eastern Kentucky hate Washington loathe Washington because they see what's happening. They see that it's not practical. They see the, hypo they see the hypocrisy every day. The, you know, the, the absence of moral authority, all that kind of stuff. But they see that it doesn't work. And it doesn't work not because you should amputate the leg. It doesn't work because nobody's making the practical choices to make it work. And that's going to require kind of revolution. I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be good for law students. I mean, you're going to you know, you get to, you can remake our system of government, but it's, it's not a stable situation. So I think it's time to think big, and so that's what some of us are trying to do. Thank you. <laughs> do we have time for questions, or, or you can throw cookies. Uh, there are no tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. It's less of a question and more of a comment. Um, I'm from Washington State, and they actually have in statute that when there's an interagency dispute, the governor has the authority to 
resolve it. And actually, the, the statute says, the governor shall employ whatever dispute resolution methods that the governor deems appropriate in resolving the dispute. Great. You're going to give me your card, and you're going to send me that, and I'll put you in the book. Very good. So, and you'll get one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent of all the royalties. <laughs> yes. One idea that frequently comes up is to send the issue to the states, laboratories of democracy, experiment, right. et cetera. Now, is it your view that that's helpful, or is it your view the states are even worse and they are the biggest rent-seeking, you know, messed up situations as possible? That has always struck me as something yeah. that would be more possible. It's a, it's, it's a great question. I was advising uh, Bruce Rauner in Illinois last year on some things. <laughs> Washington is a model of efficiency, um, uh, you know, c compared to Illinois. Um, my view is that, uh, is that we should use the leverage of each on the other. So one of the things I'm going to propose is that federal funding for public schools not be eliminated, if anything be increased, turned into block grants contingent on the states have an effect, having an effective mechanism of teacher accountability, for example. And you could do, but in general, for example, for social services and things, I think it's really important to give back citizens ownership of their communities and their schools and such. So much more freedom, much less, you know, much more innovation, the laboratory idea and such. But, but, but the states are the the the, um, the the pension irresponsibility of the states uh, requires, I think, some kind of federal mandate where they're, they're not going to get money until they get their their pension houses in order. So I think it. So I think you need to to play both ends of that to 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 get rid of these inertial institutions that have built up that are bankrupting the states as well as the federal government. Ten more questions? No, just kidding. One more. So, so what's your, you, you mentioned at the outset that countries like Canada and Germany do better. And what's the explanation for that? They presumably have interest groups and, they, and their government employees, I'm sure, have lots of civil service protections. Um, they, have a, um, they have a much more uh, um, realistic uh, view of authority. They actually give people the authority to make decisions. And they have someone else who has the authority to oversee that decision. It's really that simple. And whereas we've created a system just to, I mean, I could go on for a long time. We've created this system of government where decisions are supposed to be provably correct. And by provably correct, that means you either have to have a rule that justifies it or you have a, the zero tolerance rules in school, so some little first grader who brings a two-inch soldier with a plastic gun gets suspended, you know, the, the idiocies, right? Or metrics or objective evidence in a due process hearing. Due process. We believe in due process, right? You know what due process does when you apply it to management decisions? It, complete, it means that the standard sinks every year. Is this person so bad that they should lose their job? And the standard in any organization ought to be, is this person so good they keep their job? Due process was intended to protect against abuses of government authority, you know, taking your property away or something, putting you in jail, not second-guessing supervisors trying to keep a, the, an institution going. I mean, we have these... Um, these concepts, these kind of almost, which have, which are venerated in our system of government that are literally upside down. Germany and Canada don't have them. They actually let people make decisions, have a check and balance on it, and then it's approved or not. And that's how the world works. That's how you live your own life. It's how you run your families. If you have a business, it's how you run your business. So if you run a conference, by the way, I thought this morning's conference was great. Uh, I've gone to so many boring law school conferences. This one's really good. The, um, 
uh, another one tenth of one percent of the royalty. The, uh, anyway, the donation to George Mason Law School. The, uh, um, so the way we live our lives and the basic life truths is also the way you have to sort of organize a system of government. And for 50 years, in search of correctness, we've actually avoided coming to the truths that the panelists this morning were talking about, that all of these issues are trade-offs. They're trade-offs between privacy on the one hand and efficient markets on the other hand. And those norms change, and you have to kind of iterate all the way along. There's no truth. It requires judgment, like everything else, and we've got to get a government back that allows people to use their judgment. Thank you.